Well, welcome. Welcome in the name of that precious name of Jesus. Glad to be here. Thanks for putting up with me one more time. This is my third time to be with you here this uh, summer, and I assure you that I receive the greater blessing. It's almost as if I feel like I'm coming home sometimes when I come down here to be with you, and I appreciate it. Thanks, uh, praise team. Thanks to the scripture reader, and thank you for your presence here today. May you be blessed. I feel like I'm kind of making some new friends around here these days, but I want to introduce and welcome some, well, I guess I'll say older friends of mine. Uh, you know them, many of you know this special couple, Jamie and Donna Etheridge, Red and Donna Etheridge from Jacksonville. You know, he, uh, Red, affectionately known as Red, is one of those movers and shakers in our state and in this area for a while. He's a trustee emeritus of the university. Donna taught uh, nursing here for a while. And uh, I had the privilege of officiating in their wedding a few years ago. And I even uh, got a chance to persecute them once in a while at uh, First Baptist Church, Fort Payne. So they're right over here with my wife, Sue, and they have on that red mask, the Jacksonville Gamecock mask. So <laughs> welcome to all of you. I could tell you some more stories, but I won't if they won't say anything about me. The title of my message today is Just One is Enough. Just One is Enough. And the text is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. John chapter 6, 1 through 13, which you will recognize as the miracle of Jesus healing, of feeding the 5,000. This, by the way, is the only miracle of the Lord recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, I must say, is my favorite Gospel. John presents Jesus as God in human flesh, the incarnation, 100% God, 100% man, the unique miracle of Christianity, the incarnation. And John organizes his material, his gospel, through seven signs or wonders, such as the turning of the water into wine, the walking on the water, the uh, raising of Lazarus, the healing of the blind man, and of course, this miracle right here, the feeding of the 5,000. Let's begin reading then. I'll be reading from the New International Version of the New Testament, John chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. And this says, sometime after this, after what? After what had transpired in the previous chapter. He had performed a miracle of healing at the pool of Bethesda. And mine is the red letter edition, which shows that most of that chapter 5 is Jesus speaking about himself, about his authority as the Son of God. So John begins this chapter, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great, great cloud, crowd followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples, the Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small, uh, small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. 
You may remember the story in the book of Genesis of Abraham pleading to God on behalf of the wicked city of Sodom. Abraham, the patriarch of the Hebrews, had a relative, a nephew named Lot, and Lot and his wife were living in Sodom. Because of the immorality, the wickedness, the evil of Sodom, God was going to destroy that city. But Abraham came to the presence of God and pleaded, O oh God, if I can find just 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you please spare the city? God said, if you find 50 righteous people, I'll spare the city. Well, Abraham starts thinking some more. He thinks, that's a pretty bad place. What if I can't find but 45? And so, Lord, Lord, he comes back, if I can find only 45 righteous people in Sodom, would you spare the city? God says, Abraham, if you can find 45 righteous people, I'll spare the city. Abraham still thinks, that's a very, very wicked and evil city. Lord, he comes back one more time. If I can find just 40, would you spare the city? God says, I'll spare it for 40. Again, Abraham comes back to the Lord. What if there are only 30, 30 righteous people? God says, I'll save the city. And then it comes on down to 20 and finally to 10. And God says, if you find 10 righteous people there, I'll spare the city. Now that's where the story ends. But I really believe that if Abraham had come back to God and said, Oh Lord, if I can find just one righteous person in Sodom, would you spare the city? And God said, If you find one righteous, one good person there, I'll spare the city. You see, Abraham learned a lesson that we must learn in contemporary America, that in the arithmetic of God, in the kingdom of God, one is enough. Just one is enough. It does not take a lot to make enough. It's just because it's bigger does not necessarily mean it's better. In the kingdom of God and in the mind of Christ, one can be enough. That's why Jesus told those parables of the lost sheep, the one lost sheep, and the one lost coin, and the one lost boy. One is enough. Now, in this miracle, Jesus had been teaching these people and thousands of them had been listening all day long. It was growing late in the evening and he was concerned about their physical well-being. And so he turns to Philip, who probably was from that very region, and says, what are we going to do? Where can we buy some food for these people? And Philip said, well, it's hopeless. You know, it's too many people. We don't have enough. About that time, <clears throat> Andrew, Andrew, who was always bringing somebody to Christ, said, there's a boy here. There's one little boy here. He has a basket of five barley loaves and two small fish. And the fish would have been about sardine-like size. But what good can that be? What good is that? Jesus said, have the people sit down. The gospel writers say, several of them said that they sat down in groups of 50 or 100, even on the grass. And Jesus took that little boy's lunch and he blessed it, and he thanked God for it. <clears throat> and he passed it out, the bread and the fish. And 5,000 people were fed that day and 12 baskets left over. Actually, it very well may have been more than 5,000 people because even Matthew says 5,000 men besides the women and children. They didn't count the women and children very often in those days. This miracle teaches us that Jesus is the bread of life. You read the rest of John chapter 6, and Jesus talks about that. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of heaven. We need physical bread. We need spiritual bread. These people were given bread prepared by a miracle, and they were given and offered the bread of heaven and were fulfilled. Truly, as somebody said, it was dinner on the grounds. But one is enough. Sometimes these scriptures have a side application, and so it is in the case of this little boy. What if he had not given Jesus his lunch? 
Jesus then would not have had the resources for a miracle to bless and feed thousands and thousands of people. Just one is, a, I don't know who this boy was. It doesn't say his name. I guess his parents were there. Was that his lunch? Had they uh, missed him? Had he become separated from him? But what he had, what he gave, one little fellow, Jesus found the resources for a special miracle. One is enough. You just yourself might be the resource that the Lord can use to bless this church, to bless another life, to bless this community, and to bless the kingdom of God. Just one is enough. I heard about a man one time named Mr. Little who lived with Mrs. Little and the seven little littles in a little house on a little street in a little town where he taught at a little high school for very little salary. Somebody said, Mr. Little, how do you and Mrs. Little and the seven little littles living in a little house on a little street in a little town earning very little salary get by? To which he replied, well, every little helps. In the kingdom of God and in the church of Jesus Christ, every little helps. Every little is important. You are important. Greatness can be in you. You can just be the means of a miracle. Now, let's take this idea that one is enough, committed to the Lord, and try to apply it to ourselves. Just one is enough when it comes to our talents. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has at least one talent. It might be music. It might be athletics. It might be teaching. It might be just building and making and repairing things with your hands. God can take that one talent or more and use it and multiply it and bless it to bless this church and the kingdom of God. We may not all be equal in the number of talents that we have, but we are equal in significance and importance. Jesus told a parable one time, and I like to say that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He told the parable of the talents, remember? And one man had one talent, and one had three, and one had five. And the one talent man said, I can't do much. What can I do with my one talent? I'll just, I'll just bury it in the ground and keep it safe and sound. And when the master comes back, I'll give it back to him. And when the master came back, came back, he was very, very upset with this man because he did not use his talent and he did not multiply his talent. And he took it away from him and gave it to the five talent man. There is a phrase that says, use it or lose it. And what the one talent man did not realize is if he had been faithful, he would have received the same reward as the five talent man. Much of the lethargy of this world is not from the five talent people who refuse to use it, but the one talent person who says, that's all I can do. I can't tell you how many times in my ministry I heard church members say, oh, our church is so, is so talented and we have so much talent, so much ability. I can't do anything. What can I do? You can be yourself. You can offer who you are and what you have in the hands of the Lord like that little boy offered what he had. If one note on the piano is sour or out of tune, the whole composition can be thrown into disharmony. If one talent is not used in this congregation, it can have an effect upon the effectiveness of this church's ministry. Well, I think football season is about here. I know high school started the other night. And I know that the SEC and the ACC are planning on going on and and playing their season. This is still a fluid type situation. We'll just see what happens along the line with COVID-19, but they're practicing. And most people know that most games are won at the line of scrimmage, the offensive line or the defensive line, whichever one dominates, usually that team wins. And the offensive lineman not only must be big and strong and quick, but they must think, they must be prepared because if one lineman misses his assignment or blocks the wrong guy or doesn't block anybody, that can throw the whole play into disarray because they have to work together and communicate together. One play, one talent. 
Now, if you say, I have just one talent, well, that's enough. But if you have more than one talent, that's not enough. Commit what you have to the hands of the Lord and see what he can do with your talent. Let's apply this to our time. We don't have enough time for anything anymore, it seems. I really think that the older I become, it seems as if the world is spinning on its axis faster and faster and faster. Where does time go? These days, these weeks, these months, these years just seem to speed by and fly by. Come here, go there, do this, do that. Calling for our attention, taking care of time, family time and business time and work time and church time. I only have a minute, just 60 seconds in it. Can't refuse it, didn't seek it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute. But eternity is in it. The Bible says to redeem the time. Paul said that in the book of Romans, which literally means be stewards of your time. Be good stewards of our time. Invest some of it in the kingdom of God, in the lives of other people, in the ministry and the work of the church. The Bible says about time, what is your life but a vapor, a cloud that appears a little while and then vanishes away in the context of eternity? We have a little bit of time. Let's invest some of it in the work of the Lord. And if you have more than than a little time. Giving a little is just not enough. But as that little boy gave what he had, we all have some time. You have some time that you can invest in the life of this church. How about our material possessions? Our material possessions. It takes a lot of money to live. It takes a lot of money to support a family. It takes money to do the Lord's work. It takes money to be a church and to, to do the church's ministry. And who does the Lord depend upon to finance His work? But us, His people, you and me. I heard about a young man who became a father for the first time. And he was at the, the nursery of the hospital looking in the window at his little boy. And he was screaming his head off. And that farmer, that father did not like that. He starts tapping on the window, tapping on the nursery. Now, Donna, that's a no-no, isn't it? Don't tap on that nursery window. And he was doing that. And that nurse comes around outside, and she was about to jump on that young man. And he said, look, that's my boy in there. And he's going to be, he's going to be famous. He's going to be the president of the United States. And you let him cry like this? And she shook her finger in his face and said, let me tell you something, mister. If you were bald-headed and toothless and hungry and wet and owed already $5,000 to the national debt, you'd be crying too. <laughs> I don't know how much each newborn owes contribute to the national debt. But man, it's a lot, isn't it? What is it? They say 20-something trillion dollars. It's hard to fathom our, our little bits of money in comparison to that. But God can take what we have and what we offer Him and He can use it and He can multiply it in the life of this church, in the lives and the ministry of those to whom you minister. One day Jesus and His disciples were walking through Jerusalem and they said, look! And they were looking at the grandeur of the temple, Solomon's temple. Go back sometime and read in 1 Kings how Solomon planned and constructed that temple and how ornate it was and had gold trimmings all around it and how expensive it was. And they said, look, and there were people coming and pouring money, pouring it into the treasury. Jesus said, look, I want you to see something. It was that one lady, that one widow, dropping in what amounts to about Two pennies. And he said she gave more than anybody else because she gave out of her want and the others gave out of their great abundance. And he said that story would be told throughout all time. And it is. He can take what little you have or how much you have and multiply it and use it. Now, if you have, if you have just a little bit, that's okay. But if you have a lot more, 
then the Lord expects us to trust Him more with our possessions. So one is enough when it comes to our talent, our time, our possessions. It said that the most influential factor in the world is the ordinary individual who stands for and who tries extraordinary things. Jesus' disciples, for example, they were a motley crew. They weren't very well educated. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'll give you a manual. I'll train you. Wait till you get your master's. He said, no, you are. You be. You, one, one. You be a fisher of men. What can one man do? Well, let me tell you this. In 1842, an Indiana farmer named Henry Shoemaker provided a homemade ballot for a man running for the Indiana legislature. And when the vote was tied, the election official decided to count that homemade ballot. Boy, that would work in November real good, wouldn't it? The vote was tied and they counted this homemade ballot and a man named Madison Marsh won by one vote, 371 to 370. In 1843, the Indiana legislature was to select a member of the Senate to Washington to fill the term, unexpired term, of one who had died. And the vote was tied, and Madison Marsh cast the deciding vote for a man named Hannigan. In 1845, when Texas asked to enter the Union, the vote was tied in the Senate until Senator Hannigan cast the deciding ballot. In 1846, when the president asked for declaration of war against Mexico, the vote was tied. And guess who cast the deciding vote? Hannigan. One farmer, one individual, one vote helped change the course of history. Let me tell you one more. I may have used this some years ago here. I don't really recall. But once upon a time, there was a man named Edward Kimball. And Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher of young people in a church in Detroit. He would visit his students, his Sunday school class during the week. And there was a young man in his class named Dwight Moody. And he was concerned about Dwight Moody's salvation. Dwight was a young man who worked in a shoe store. And one day, Edward Kimball went there. He was going to really see if he could get Dwight Moody to trust Christ. And Moody, uh, this man, Kimball, was so, so timid and so shy and afraid that he walked back and forth in front of the shoe store, afraid to go in. Finally, he got up nerve. He went in. He talked to Dwight Moody, and he walked out disappointed. He hadn't made a decision. But the seed of the gospel was sown by that Sunday school teacher. And Dwight L. Moody gave his life to Christ and became a great evangelist back in his day, preaching to more people and traveling more greater distance than anybody to his day. In his ministry, there was a man who heard him preach named Wilbur Chapman, and Wilbur Chapman became a minister. And Wilbur Chapman was preaching one time at a baseball player named Billy Sunday. You ever heard of Billy Sunday? heard, was saved, and became a great evangelist. Billy Sunday was one of those kind of abrasive, kind of hellfire, brimstone type preachers. He was the one who used to say, being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. In one of his crusades, there was a man named Mordecai Ham who was saved. And Mordecai Ham became a, a pretty good traveling preacher. And he was preaching a two or three month tent revival one time in Charlotte, North Carolina. And a group of teenage boys slipped in just to see what was going on. They weren't interested. And one of them was so interested, he came back. And he was singing in the choir one night, 18-year-old boy named Billy Frank. And he was saved one night. And he went home and he said, Mama, I'm a different boy now. And he was. William Franklin, Billy Graham. Look at the difference he's made. And it all started back here with one man, one faithful Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. A preacher said he dreamed one night that he went into a store and an angel was behind the counter. And the angel said, I'll give you, we sell here, whatever you want. 
The man said, I want happiness. I want peace. I want, I want end of hatred. This, and the angel said, no, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. We don't sell the fruit. We just sell the seed. The seed. You can count the number of apples on a tree, but who can count the number of apples in a seed? One seed. I see some of these young boys and girls in here. You can make a difference. Greatness is in you. You can be the seed of something great in the kingdom of God if you give yourself, all of us, our, our time, our talent, our finances. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this day, for this wonderful miracle. Feed us with the bread of heaven, but also, O oh Lord, take who we are and what we are and use it to advance your kingdom in this place and to bless these people. In Jesus' name, amen.